All right, cool. So um, I guess I got to get a chance to, to meet everyone um, as we were chatting in the beginning, but uh, I'm Mike Barber and I'm an associate editor with the, the Journal of Online Learning Research. And um, my colleague here, Mary, is the editor-in-chief um, and she's been around, I guess, for about two, a little bit better than two years with the journal now. And I've been uh, with the journal for about a year as the associate editor. Um, so basically the, the journal itself uh, is focused specifically upon K-12 or school sector, online, hybrid, distance, blended, you know, pick which remote, whichever term you want to use, but essentially um, any sort of um, type of learning that we often associate with the virtual learning network and, and for that matter, Takura as well uh, in New Zealand and uh, sp focus specifically upon the school sector. Uh, so we tend not to publish uh, higher ed pieces. Uh, the higher ed pieces that we do publish uh, tend to be focused upon essentially preparing um, school sector teachers uh, because that's obviously an important area as well. Uh, the journal has been around for about eight years now. Um, it's sponsored by the Society for Information Technology and Teacher Education, as well as the Association for the Advancement of Computing and Education. Uh, we publish three times a year, so there are three issues. Um, it's 100% online, similar to the Journal of Online Learning Research, or I guess, what is it? The journal, sorry, the Journal of Flexible Distance Learn. I'm trying to remember what the just, flan just, 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 just. Yeah. Flexible and distance online. And distance. Yeah. When they started putting flexible in there, I always got the acronym wrong after that. It's the <laughs> old journal of distance learning that used to be done by deans once upon a time. Um, and uh, so it's, but it's available online that way. And, and we try to make sure that folks understand that because um, obviously one of the advantages of an open access journal is the fact that it can get out to practitioners in a way that's freely available. Unlike a lot of the research that gets published in academia, which is behind a paywall and you've got to pay like 25 or 30 bucks American to get a copy of the article or go begging to the author, although it's not really much of a beg because we're more than happy to send you stuff. Um, we're more than happy just to think that people actually want to read our stuff, but that's neither here nor there. Um, this journal is 100% free available online. Um, and um, we really have three sort of main sections in there. Uh, there's the traditional sort of, you know, regular section, if you will, the, the research section. Um, but there's two that I think uh, uh, would be more applicable to this particular audience. Uh, so there's an international section, um, which uh, because in the first five to six years of the journal, uh, the vast majority of articles that were published were published based on the U.S. Uh, so... Um, basically, we created first an international section to try to encourage uh, folks to, uh, you know, submit from outside of the U.S. And the type of stuff that, that we'd often publish in there, first of all, it doesn't go through the regular peer review. Uh, we actually have reviewers specific to the international section uh, that are looking at it with a slightly different lens than they do the, the general section um, to try to get more stuff out there. Uh, those of you that are you know, engaged in, in, in graduate work um, who have to write papers or theses or that kind of thing, uh, those are all kinds of, of uh, articles that, that we'd be really interested in. Actually, I'm kind of glad that, that Carolyn is in the audience because uh, a good example of that, um, this is actually a, a paper. Uh, I just dropped the link into the chat there. Uh, that Carolyn uh, wrote for one of her courses that uh, basically uh, she said, actually, it's part of a paper. We actually ended up writing two articles out of it um, that uh, she had put together for just one of the classes that uh, that she was taking. And um, basically she sent it to me and the two of us together cut it up into two separate articles and that there is one of those articles. So it was just a class paper based upon experiences that um, that she was having some of the data that she collected um, while she was with the uh, the Farnet uh, virtual learning or the Farnet uh, e-learning cluster. Um, if you have something more formal, the international section is probably a good place for it. 
Uh, but what I really want to focus our time upon today, or the few minutes I'm going to talk about up front, is the practitioner corner, which is a new section that we introduced last year. And we've basically spent the last 11 months trying to drum up interest in it. Um, this is really designed to be for a practitioner audience, written by a practitioner audience. So there's a lot of interesting, creative, innovative things that you guys are doing in your online and blended classes. Things that as researchers, we'd be interested in knowing, but by the same token, things that the teacher 500 miles or halfway around the globe, um, you know, struggling with the same issue and would like ideas and strategies on how to do it. And, and this is a section for that. Um, so like the international section, it doesn't go through a traditional peer review. Um, you'll notice that the length of it is, is, is a lot shorter than what you would find uh, in our traditional sections. Um, the formal description is this. So this is the language that you'll find on the website. And, and I'll drop the link if Mary hasn't done it already to the website in the uh, chat. Um, and you can go and look at that. What this basically boils down to from your perspective is this is sort of the framework of the article. You know, there's some sort of problem that you had, you know, that you, you were dissatisfied with the discussions that were happening in your discussion forum. Um, you found that, you know, students weren't, um, you know, accessing the content as frequently as you would want, or um, you wanted to come up with other forms of assessment for your students instead of the auto-corrected quizzes that a lot of the LMSs encourage because it makes it easier, or, or something that was a lot more time-consuming on your end, and you were looking for alternatives for these. But there was something that you wanted to, to, to fix, essentially, something you wanted to try. Um, so basically the article starts with that, you know, this is what I'm looking to address. This is what I actually tried to do. And, and in some cases it's a single thing, you know, here's a particular pedagogical strategy that I used. Here's a particular tool that I might've introduced, you know, maybe the discussion forum in, um, your learning management system wasn't what you were looking for, but you tried voice threads or Flipgrid or, um, you know, so it could be a specific tool that you focused upon. It could be a strategy you focused upon. Um, it, it, it really sort of doesn't matter. Um, the key part with the, the practitioner corner, and, and this is, I guess, what would make it a little bit different than just, you know, this is what I did and I think it worked because of this, is the fact that it still does require some, some data collection. Um, now, the amount of data collection and the formal nature of the data collection um, is kind of immaterial. Um, basically, what we're looking to do is to figure out that you guys tried to address your problem and, and come up with a solution based upon some sort of data-driven decision-making. Um, so as an example, if I use that discussion form aspect of it, um, you know, maybe a, a teacher tried uh, some different strategy for engaging students in the discussion form. Uh, maybe they set up, you know, limits that, you know, they wanted students to respond by this date and they had to, um, you know, they came up with a criteria for it, if you will. And the data that they used was basically just how many words per student were generated more after they used the strategy compared to when they were using it before. You know, um, they could look at it and, you know, decide based upon student grades. They could look at it based upon um, the data collected by the learning management system, you know, in terms of logins and, and how many times they access the content or how much time they spent engaged in the content. So the level of data that's required for these kinds of articles isn't uh, systematic in nature. Um, it isn't sort of the formal type of thing that you would normally associate with research, but it's basically a way for um, your reader, as you were you know, putting this together, to figure out that you made these decisions and, and you based your understanding of whether or not it worked on more than just your gut feeling. Um, so, and then based upon that data that you collect, you know, it worked, it worked a little bit, it worked completely, it kind of worked a little bit, but we wanted to revise it. And, you know, so essentially, what did you do after you figured out whether or not it was successful or not, or how successful it was? 
Um, and if you only did sort of one cycle of it, if you were to do this again, or if you were to advise somebody who wanted to address the same problem and start where you finished, what would you tell them to do to start off with based upon what you learned? Um, so that's sort of the the the, the structure of it. And, and again, we're looking at something that's about a thousand to, I think the maximum we had back there was um, 3,500 words. Uh, so if you're wondering what that looks like, a thousand words is basically uh, three pages double spaced, because um, you usually get about 300 words per page on a double spaced typed page. Um, so obviously 3,500 would be about 10 pages, 12 pages, uh, depending upon, you know, if, if uh, how wordy you were along with that. Um, so that's sort of the, the idea behind the practitioner section. And what we're hoping is that come um, the first issue in 2023, now that we've spent uh, basically a year sort of trying to get some interest in this from practitioners, uh, that we can start publishing these. So we don't have any yet that have been submitted. Um, we've got a lot of folks that, that have been interested in it. Um, we're hoping that we're going to start to see submissions in the next month or two. Uh, so that our first issue in 2023, which will come out probably in March-ish, uh, should have a, an, an article or two in that section. Uh, because it's an online journal, there is no minimum or maximum number that we uh, have to uh, publish. So if we get six good submissions, we can publish six articles. So it's not like we have a page limitation for the, the journal or anything like that. And basically, um, that's sort of it in terms of the, the formal part of it. Um, I mean, the rest of the, the time that we've got here, um, Mary and I can basically, if you have ideas of things that you might be interested in doing with this uh, for either the international section or in particular the practitioner's corner, um, we're basically here to bounce some ideas around.